have the Apostolic Gospels, the Apostolic History, and now the Apostolic Epistle, Epistles. Uh, now, Epistle is a letter. Okay? It's the Epistolos in Greek is just the term for a letter. Okay, so it's very simple. And there's two kinds of uh, epistles. There are the Pauline epistles and the Catholic epistles. Uh, first of all, the Pauline epistles, first of, uh, then they are divided into two groups. There's the so-called ecclesiastical epistles, which are letters to churches. Um, churches are go, uh, like the churches in Rome or Corinth or various other places. Um, so ecclesiastical epistles, Romans through to Second Thessalonians, and the ones that you'll be looking at are all ecclesiastical epistles, I think, from memory. Um, and then there are the pastoral epistles, Paul writing to fellow pastors, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Now, what's important about those pastoral epistles is that they form the basis of you know, what we call now pastoral theology. Um, all pastoral theology and everything you learn here in pastoral theology basically is built on those four letters. Uh, develop. Very important for your training as pastors. Okay? Ecclesiastical epistles, uh, pastoral epistles. And then there are the so-called Catholic epistles. Don't confuse that Catholic with Roman Catholic. Catholic means uh, having to do with the whole. The term Catholic comes from uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who talks about the church cut oli, cut ale, which means according to the whole, the whole church. Um, so it's, these are letters that are not written just to one church, but to all the churches, or to groups of churches, um, rather than a single congregation. Is, yes? Is that how we can word universe, church universe? Yes. Yes. Um, <coughs> however, universal has a different uh, uh, feeling to it, or sense to it, connotation to it. Um, uh, they are from Hebrews through to Jude. And then, as you know, the last book of the New Testament is the apostolic prophecy, the book of John. Now, um, uh, books in the Bible are not just thrown together in an accidental kind of way, but they're arranged very, very carefully. Um, just two questions. Why is it that the book of Acts is separated from Luke and brought between John and Romans. Why do we have the book of Acts in its present position in the New Testament? It shows what happened after Jesus' life. Well, then it could have been just after uh, uh, Acts. I mean, after Luke. But then you've got John and Kelly jumping back and forth. Okay, now why does John come where it is? It is? There's four Gospels which are telling of Jesus' life. Yes. Well, the three synoptic Gospels telling of Jesus' Jesus life. Jesus' yeah. life. And then John's Gospel telling of Jesus' life and its connotations. Yes. And for some reason we didn't stick John's, John's Gospel first. Yeah, why not? Let's go back. Why is it that Matthew is the first Gospel? Because Matthew's a catechism. Catechism. Yeah. Well, there's no reason why that should be first then, except catechism has to do with baptism. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, there's another reason why Matthew comes first. Matthew continually refers back to the Old Testament. So Matthew links Old Covenant, New Covenant. Okay? And it's also, secondly, it, has, it, it focuses on baptism, around baptism, catechesis, which is the beginning, not only Jesus' baptism, but our baptism, the foundation of the church and the Christian life. Why is it then that uh, the Gospels end with John? No, uh, what would have been logical, as far as I can see, is to have Matthew, Mark, John, then Luke and Acts together, Okay, now, why is 
John in its present position? Matthew, why are the three synoptics together? Why does John come after the synoptics? Luke as a gospel rather than a huge extended book or something. Number one, so it emphasizes the gospel nature of Luke rather than historical nature of Luke. Another reason, John focus, whereas Matthew, Mark and Luke focus back on? What Christ did. Did. John focuses on what Christ is? Doing, doing now in the church. And that's what Luke, uh, Acts focuses on as well. That's what Acts focuses on, the work of Jesus in the church. Now, let's go to the next question then. Why is it that Acts introduces the Pauline letters? Yes, Stephen? It introduced, shows us who Paul is, number one, and churches. what the churches are that Paul writes to, and who Timothy is, who Titus is. I know. Um, so uh, otherwise, we don't know who on earth is Paul, or um, who are the Romans, etc. Okay, now next question. Next question. Why is it that even though Romans was one of the last letters that Paul wrote to churches, it comes first in the collection of Paul's letters. Because that's where the Acts ends? No, because it's, well, it's a very inclusive uh, epistle yep. that sums up Paul's whole theology. Okay, it sums up Paul's theology and so it gives us an interpretive key, what scholars call a hermeneutical, a hermeneutic for reading all the other epistles of Paul. You know, uh, there's two letters that Paul wrote which were not, didn't address immediate problems in churches. The two letters in which Paul summarizes his theology and gives you some, the whole picture. The most comprehensive of his letters is Romans. Do you know which the other epistle is in which he uh, 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 draws together his theology? Galatians. No, Galatians is a very specific problem. The problem is, the problem in Galatians is, do Christians, do Gentile Christians have to be circumcised to enjoy all the blessings of the Holy Spirit? So it's a question of circumcision there. Yeah, won't you? Timothy? No, no, letters to churches. Churches. The one that is most, uh, uh, doesn't deal with specific problems, the biggest summary is Ephesians. Ephesians. Just take note of it, those you, Ephesians. Sorry. Righto. Note well. It, no. No, it does. I know it. It has a specific purpose, but it doesn't deal with a particular problem, and it deals more generally. So, why does Romans come first? Because it gives you the lenses, the glasses, through which you are to read the other letters. So, uh, if you take Galatians by itself, um, you, can get a, you can misread Paul, or if you take 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians or Thessalonians by itself, you can misread, misunderstand Paul. Now, I've... Uh, so, Acts is an introduction to Paul's epistle. It gives us the authority of Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. It uh, gives us the identity of the congregations that received Paul's letters and what Paul's connection with these congregations was. He founded them. He uh, was their pastor. So, it's him as a pastor writing to former congregations, if you can put it in modern terms. Now, what's very significant about each one of Paul's letters is the basic arrangement of them. Um, now, we have a funny tradition in writing letters, um, is that we have an envelope in which we give the address, but then when we come to the letter itself, we have dear, our tradition is dear such and such, such and such, and how do we end the letter? Choose. You'll see, and then we sign. Sign. Okay. Um, that's the particular convention, um, uh, and depends on the kind of letter. You know, you have uh, whether it is uh, dear sir, 
um, or the form of address at the beginning. You address the person that you're writing to, and at the end of the letter you sign off. Now, to some extent, this is rather illogical. Can you see what the problem is? Well, Stephen? Right. The problem is that uh, the person opens the letter. Yes. And of course, they knew it was to them already because yes. they got it. Yes. I don't know who wrote it until they heard it finished. Okay, <laughs> can you? So, the Greek way, the way that people wrote letters in the ancient world was much more logical. Yeah. They put at front, they put the person right at the front. No. John Kleinig to Stephen Cronow and uh, you would give your credentials you know, and you'd see straight away whether this was a love letter or a personal letter or a business letter as the case may be. Um, don't, now you can see the convention here and there's a couple of other funny things that happen in Paul's letters which are significant. They uh, uh, fit this pattern and yet they depart from this pattern um, uh, you, okay, so this is the basic form that you have. You get the opening of the letter. Uh, you get the address of the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the opening part. First of all, there's the name of the writer or the writers. And then you get the naming of the recipients. And then you get a greeting. Now, usually the greeting in classical Greek letters was cheers or uh, good luck. Now, um, Paul gives a different kind of greeting. Um, and then uh, but what's unique, uh, instead of having the normal thing, I hope you're going well. Now, the classical Greek one was cheers or um, peace. Good luck, something like that. Um, uh, and then you go uh, uh, to, uh, no, I hope things are going well. Things are going well with me. Now look at the difference between that and the way Paul opens a letter. Can you uh, um, uh, read 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 9, please, Tony? You've got the easy song. Let's take it. He's already got two things written there. <laughs> yeah, but it applies to all Paul's letters. Uh, yes, it's for all of them. Have exactly the same thing. Tony, read. Yeah. One to nine. All of them exactly. Yes. Okay. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Sosthenes. To the Church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Right, can you see the expansion? Paul not only gives his credentials, um, his name, but also his credentials. Paul, he's an apostle. And notice it's a, a letter that's co-authored. Paul didn't write him by itself, but he wrote it together with Sosthenes, a fellow pastor. And then you get the reference to the church, the assembly. Remember that church equals assembled, assembly or assembled congregation. So Paul writing to the assembly in Corinth, the assembly of God. Okay, keep going. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's something different here. Instead of just saying peace to you, which would have been a common greeting, he adds grace. grace and peace, not from Paul, but from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what um, he turns a normal secular greeting into a liturgical greeting. Um, and this liturgical greeting you'll find is common in the ancient world as the introduction to a sermon. Keep going. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and, and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed to you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. 
Here you get Paul's uh, prayer of thanksgiving. He says, I always, now always he has the idea of every morning, every evening. Better regularly rather than always. So when Paul prays in his morning and evening prayers, he thanks God for the Christians in Corinth. Now, take note that in all letters except one, Paul begins the letter with a prayer of thanksgiving for the congregation. Aha, yes, Galatians. And so that's very significant where it isn't there. Uh, um, Galatians, the only one. Um, right, so that's the opening of the letter. Then you get the body of the letter. Um, and Paul arranges it very, most letters very carefully. Usually there's two parts to them, to a letter, but so, they differ depending on the purpose. Um, usually there's a theological part, and then there's a therefore part, which deals with the uh, 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 consequences uh, of the theology, the application of the theology. Um, in Romans, the theological part is 1 through to 11, and then the practical part is 12 through to 16. You get that body. It's not always the case, but you quite often get that kind of division. And then, then you get a strange conclusion. Um, uh, let's read Levi chapter uh, 26 of 1 Corinthians. Verse uh, 20 to 24, not 26, 16, 16, there's no 26, 16, Twenty to 24. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Just stop there, which means that the rest of the letter is yes. not written by him, but it's dictated by him. Yes. So he writes this with his own hand. So this is a personal touch to the letter. You can see a change in handwriting here. And then he goes on. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, at the end of the letter, you get what is a, a looks like a jumble of material that doesn't make much sense. Yeah, and the coming of Jesus. Yep. Why here at the end of the letter. Now you won't make sense of these endings unless you see um, that these are basically liturgical and you won't see that they're liturgical unless you take notice of one very important fact. Where does Paul assume that this letter will be read? In church. In church. And uh, what part of church? Is it just the church building? In place of the sermon. In the place of the sermon. So Paul's letters were sermon letters. They were written sermons that the pastor would read to the congregation. And you can see this by the beginning and the end of the letter. Take notice this very closely. Number one, you get the greeting. Grace, the grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the so-called apostolic greeting. Um, and to the present day, not just in our Lutheran tradition, but going right back to the early church and to Paul, that was the beginning of the sermon. Now, whenever I preach, I say, I read the text, might have a prayer, and then I begin the sermon and say, grace to you and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a blessing, it's a greeting. Um, uh, by means of that, speaking that, I give you, transmit you grace and peace from God the Father through Jesus Christ to the congregation and indicate that this sermon is not just going to be information but the preaching brings the peace of God to people, brings the grace of God to people who hear it. So you get the beginning of the letter indicating its liturgical context, that it takes the place of the sermon. And th this is also uh, shown at the end of the letter. Um, shows 
that this was followed by the communion liturgy. Um, and you can see this if you uh, go to uh, the Didache in the early church. We'll hear about that in Introduction to Worship. Um, and then also in other liturgical material we have from the early church. Uh, you had the sequence, the following sequence. You had the readings. Um, then you had the sermon. After the sermon, you had prayers. Then you had the exchange of peace. And then you had the begin beginning of the communion liturgy. Um, and there's parts here of the communion liturgy. He says, greet one another with the kiss of peace. Kiss of peace the holy kiss. The kiss of peace. Right, that's um, in the... We have it in a number of possible different places, but in the early church it was after the prayer of the church and before the beginning of the communion liturgy. Why do we do in the church? Exchanging the peace of the Lord. So we just say, uh, uh, the peace of the Lord be with you, Garth. Okay, now in the ancient church um, it was slightly different. Men would sit on one side, women on the other side. Come, Tony, and I'll give you the peace of the Lord. I'll give you a holy kiss. Okay, which is like this. Okay, so yep. Like okay. that. Is that what the Russian? That's still in. That's gone in Russia, and it's the normal Russian um, and Southern European greeting in parts where you get the Orthodox tradition, which is very ancient. So you get the exchange of the holy kiss, and then there is the anathema, which is the formula of excommunication. Um, uh, uh, if anyone doesn't love the Lord, the Greek is anathema. If anyone doesn't love the Lord, let him be excommunicated, which, in, which, is the, um, which was used at the beginning of the communion liturgy to exclude those who were not baptized and not believers and not at peace with each other uh, from Holy Communion. Okay? So it was part of the communion liturgy and the fact that you have a Aramaic word, anathema, shows that, uh, even though this is a Greek congregation, shows that this goes right the way back to the Jerusalem church. Did you see, hear that? You have an Aramaic word used in a Greek congregation in Corinth, which shows that this is part of a liturgy that goes all the way back to the mother church in Jerusalem, where you had... Uh, uh, Aramaic as its language. And then you have the uh, prayer, Maranatha. Uh, it's translated here, come Lord Jesus, but it's Aramaic. Maran is Lord in Aramaic. Atta means come. Now, that's the communion prayer. And I don't know whether you've noticed that it's, uh, we have it in one of our orders, the service alternative form, after the words of institution, the congregation says, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. I've done that service once. Have you? Only once? Yes. What a shame. Truly. Always, always the service with communion at Bethlehem. They did it once. Okay. It was pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, we'll be having that at the end of this term, or one form of it. Uh, so get used to it. It's look at the, uh, uh, it's uh, used quite commonly in many parts of our church, and then you get the last part of it, which is the uh, greeting for uh, uh, Christ's grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We have a slightly variant form of that in Holy Communion, not the grace of the Lord be with you, but the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. So, um, an older form, that was the form that, w that you, was common in Rome. The Lord be with you and also with you. In the Eastern Church to the present day, it, you have the grace of the Lord be with you and also with you as the beginning of the communion service. So, what's, what's, is, is there any difference? There's a slightly different it's emphasis. The, the Lord be with you indicates that Jesus is present as our intercessor, as our praise leader, leading us in the communion liturgy. The grace of the Lord uh, emphasizes that Jesus is with us in the communion service, bringing us grace from God the Father and giving us grace 
through his body and blood in the sacrament. So slightly different function and different emphasis, but not all that much difference. The function is different. Right, now can you see um, the liturgical context here of Paul's letters? There's another funny feature here, is the exchange of greetings. Um, Dylan, since you are so eager and attentive, can you read verse 19 through to verse 21? And uh, you'll notice that there's something odd going on here of chapter 16. Oh, nice of which? Of 1 Corinthians, that's what we're talking about. 16, 16 19 to 21. No, we read yeah, and, but uh, this, we haven't read verse 19. Uh, the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. I don't know, Aquila? Aquila, Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla. Greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meet, meets at their house. Now, this is written from Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla were former members of one of the congregations in Rome, but they also worked in uh, first uh, in Corinth um, and the church that meets in their house now, notice the reference here to the house church here they uh, send their greetings keep going all the brothers here send you greetings greet one another with a holy kiss I Paul write this greeting in my own hand now there's something funny going on here uh, usually you greet somebody when you when when you meet them, when you're present with them. Face to face. Face to face. But here you get greetings being exchanged to people who are physically separated from each other. And yet Paul acts as if they are present with each other. Can I emphasize that again? Look for oddity, clinic principle. Usually you greet somebody when you meet them, face to face. Here Paul exchanges greetings between people who are physically, geographically separated from each other and they greet each other as if they were present with each other and they greet they each other... You got it. Um, and he does so at the beginning of the communion liturgy. Now Dr. Zasser in um, one of his essays uh, uh, summarizes this beautifully um, and well and you've got it there as a handout um, long before there were any uh, gospels the letters of Paul were read in the divine service over and over again right from the start they were read aloud in the divine service to the congregation as a substitute for the spoken word of the apostle so instead of the apostle preaching in fact, the Apostle was preaching and present preaching through his letter. So the letter is the voice of the Apostle. This is evident from the inclusion of the oldest formula from the Christian liturgy at their end. Thus, the oldest fragment of the Eucharistic liturgy that we have is found in 1 Corinthians. The conclusion of 1 Corinthians with Greek one another with a holy kiss, points to the celebration of the Lord's Supper after the reading of the letter. The Lord's Supper began with the exchange of the kiss of peace. The writer of such a letter and the congregation whose greetings he gives are, as it were, present in the Spirit. They join together in the fellowship of congregations assembled far away from them at the Lord's table just as we, who live many centuries later, are included in this congregation as we hear and read this ancient letter with reverence. We are part of the same communion of saints in which the whole Church of God is one at all times and in all places. So, uh, as we hear this letter, as we receive these greetings, we are united um, with Christians who lived in the past, Christians in the present, the whole communion of saints. Um, and it is around the Lord's table that we are one. That time and space, in a sense, is 
are transcended. Why? Because we all together stand in the same place in the heavenly assembly. Okay, now in conclusion, where have I got it? I've lost one of my things. Any questions on that? First, um, before? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I was thinking. You were thinking, good. With the, um, uh, if yes. we think that the saints from like all time are, are there in that place with us at that point in time yes. during worship, then technically there'd be nothing wrong with the Catholics asking the other saints during that to pray for them as well. Well, we do that. We pray not just for them, but we pray with them. Um, that's them to intercede on our behalf. Sorry. What the hell they do with Mary? How they pray to Mary? Yeah. And like how they intercede. Them, praying for them, but doing it during worship. Yep. Nothing yep. Wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and depends on how it's done. Well, yes, they we you can uh, they intercede for us. We can ask them to intercede for them. But uh, what we don't do, do is pray for. The salvation of those who's died. There's a slight difference between those two. Uh, yeah, um, and that's look. That's what we do in the divine service. Um, uh, we sing together with Mary every time we sing the song of Mary, and she sings together with us. We sing together with uh, uh, Simeon and uh, Zechariah. Uh, we sing together with David. David prays for us when he prays for the Psalms. Right? This happens then in the divine service. Yeah. Uh, in Hebrews, the passage we're going to look at uh, tomorrow uh, says, You've come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, and you've come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. We're united with the people who've gone before us in the divine service. Yes. Mean that when I pray one of the Psalms of David, David is interceding on my behalf. Jesus, no, da, uh, David is praying. Right. Jesus is praying with David. Jesus is praying through David. Jesus is praying for us. David is praying for us. Uh, we are praying together with David. To All Christ. that together. <laughs> well, together with Christ. Because Christ is the one who prays the Psalms, just as he prays the Lord's Prayer. So whenever I say a Psalm, I'm joining with who? Jesus. Um, I'm meditating with Jesus, I'm praising with Jesus. They are the prayers of Jesus. And Jesus takes, um, uh, they're the Psalms of David, Jesus uh, who is the son of David, the heir of David, takes David's prayers and makes them his own. And then he gives it to us as not as David's prayers, but as his prayers to, to the Father together with us. Together with David, so together I, with us. I heard something different there, so. Okay, it's a bit complicated. Can you see the way it works? Um, and you won't understand the use of psalms in, in the Christian church, and particularly in worship, unless you see uh, how profound that is. And that's, that, that's that in, in, in intercessory stuff. That's the intercessory stuff. Jesus living to intercede for us. Uh, he leads us in our prayers and praises. He takes all human prayers and brings them to the Father and in his praying. That's what you try, That's what you're explaining yesterday in, in that diagram that, that intercessory stuff. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Now, any other questions generally about the epistles? We'll have a break and so Garth can have plenty of time. Any questions on the epistles? I've also given you a handout there with rough indications of the dates. Um, you'll find as you read it, there is some dispute exactly as to when particular letters were written. Um, I've given... Yes, that thing. Uh, we, you know, that's just for your benefit as a uh, checklist. Lastly, when you um, go through your letters, uh, I've got a. Uh, uh, you don't have to do a map of the congregations. I've got one here that can be used in class. 
So Rome to start off with. Okay, we start here in this part of the Mediterranean world. Um, then Corinthians comes here and so on. So don't don't make your own map. I've got a map here for you. Okay, I'll leave it there, if you like. Okay, let's have a break. Oh no, I was going to give you this, sorry.